This morning we're continuing in Mark's um, gospel. We're going to be looking at verses 46 through 52. So if you'd like to turn that up, it might be helpful to follow along. This morning we're looking at the healing of blind Bartimaeus. And what we want to see, of course, is not just the fact that a man's eyes were opened to be able to see again, which is um, actually irrefutable evidence that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is who he claims to be, and that he is the only source of life. But we do want to try to understand why it is that Bartimaeus was so eager to get up and to seek the Lord and, and how his heart was changed that he might follow the Lord. But let's go ahead and read the, uh, the account from Mark 10, verses 46 through 52. Mark writes, and they came to Jericho. And as he was going out from Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. And when he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out, and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many were sternly telling him to be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take courage, arise. He is calling for you. And casting aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus and answering him, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight and began following him on the road. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, don't, let's not forget that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And this would be his last trip to Jerusalem in his earthly ministry. It was here that our Lord would give up his life in order that he might grant life to you and to me through faith in his name. Now, Jesus had just told his disciples what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem, that he was going to be betrayed and handed over to the leaders of Israel who would condemn him and then hand him over to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles would mock him, they would spit on him, they would beat him and kill him. But after three days, he would rise again. Now, the Lord also told them that if they wanted places of honor in his kingdom, and by the way, he was going as, as it were, he's going to present himself to Israel as their king, and they're going to reject him, and yet Christ is going to be... Uh, uh, crowned king over all creation. He is going to receive a kingdom. And he says to his disciples, if you want places of honor in my kingdom, then you must be willing to serve as well and also to suffer just as he was about to suffer. Again, as we saw last week, if you want the Lord to honor you, you do have to become the slave of all. It's the one who serves the most, the one who suffers the most, for the Lord that will be honored the most. James and John wanted those places of honor, but Jesus said it's not his to give, but rather for those for whom it has been prepared. And Jesus said the way that anyone will obtain those seats or any places of honor in the kingdom is in this way and only through this way, service and suffering. Now, Paul believed that, which is the reason why he gave himself fully and completely to service and to suffering. I don't know if, if any human being besides our Lord Jesus Christ ever served as well as Paul did or suffered as much as he did. And for that reason, he will be honored. The thing is, if you believe that that's true, if I believe that's true, it should make a difference in the way we live. We should give ourselves more to service and not worry whether or not we suffer, but rather glory in the fact that we are suffering for Christ because that is the way to obtain honor in his kingdom. Well, now we see our Lord Jesus traveling through Jericho, and as you know, Jericho is near Jerusalem, about 15 miles away. He's getting very close. And as he's traveling toward Jerusalem, a large crowd is following him. And of course, 
it's hard to miss a large crowd uh, going through town, and even the blind can't seem to miss it because of all the commotion that's ongoing. And as Bartimaeus is sitting by the side of the road, he's wondering what this big crowd is all about, and so um, he understands from what people are saying that Jesus is passing by. Now, he knew enough about Jesus Christ by this time to, knew, to know precisely who he was. Jesus was not just a good teacher, not just you know, a, a public figure or a charismatic figure that people like to follow, but he is, in fact, the son of David. It is interesting that this is really the first time in the Gospel of Mark that that phrase is even used, although we know from the other Gospels that people used it before now. They understood who Jesus was and is the son of David, the Messiah. He is the Christ, the one that God had promised to send into the world, the one who was going to save them. He is the Savior. Well, Bartimaeus understood that. He also knew what Jesus was able to do for him, something that no one else could do, and that is heal him. And he knew of his willingness. Jesus is full of mercy. And so he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And even though people around him were trying to stop him, probably because he might have bothered them, the more they tried to stop him, the more he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And his efforts paid off. Jesus heard him. He stopped and called for him. Bartimaeus threw off his cloak and immediately jumped up and came to him. Jesus asked, what do you want? And he says, I want to see again. And so Jesus opened his eyes. Jesus, when he said, go, your faith has made you well, his sight returned to him, and Bartimaeus followed Jesus. Now again, this is one of the many miracles that our Lord Jesus Christ did to prove who he was, to prove that he was sent from God, to prove that he was the Messiah, that he is the Savior the only one who can really save them from God's wrath. But of course, it's more than just the fact, uh, I should say this account shows us more than just the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. And this miracle, I believe, shows us more than that because you know, even though there were many people who were healed through faith in the Savior, there were those who were also saved at the same time because of a faith that they had in Jesus Christ. Now Bartimaeus came to Jesus and he was physically blind, but when he left, he could see not only physically, but he could also see spiritually. And that's because of what was going on behind the scenes and something that perhaps sometimes we're not as aware of. We read this text and we say a man was blind and he could see Jesus is the Messiah. Well, that's true. But we do need to realize there's a reason why Bartimaeus sought the Lord the way that he did. And there was also something that Bartimaeus had to do when, when Jesus called him in order to receive this blessing. The reason why Bartimaeus sought the Lord in this way is because the Lord was first seeking after him. I imagine a lot of people in those days were seeking the Lord for, like I said, just for healing. And certainly there was something of that here in Bartimaeus, but there is something more. And we want to look at that more this morning. This morning I want us to consider two things from this particular account. And I suppose this would be true of anyone who came to Jesus Christ and received his mercy. And it has to be true of you if you are going to receive his mercy. First of all, if you want to be saved, the Lord does have to call you inwardly, that's something that's going on behind the scenes here. But secondly, if you would be saved, he must also call you outwardly, that is through his gospel, and you need to respond to that gospel. You need to trust Jesus. So first of all, if you would be saved, the Lord must first call you inwardly. The Lord has to initiate. The Lord has to reach out to you first. The Lord has to seek you. This is something that many who profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ are really entirely in the dark about. They don't understand the distinguishing grace of God. The fact that he is the one who is sovereign over whom he will save. They believe that either the Lord seeks everyone 
like Jesus when he left the 99 and went out to seek after the one, that one that he goes out to seek after in their view is the whole world. So he either seeks everyone or he basically seeks no one. Bas you know, people need to seek him instead. Well, I think I can echo the words of Augustus Toplady who penned that second hymn that we heard this morning, that those views take away from the glory of God. They steal some of the credit that is his due. Because the Bible teaches us that no one seeks God apart from his grace. Paul tells us in so many words in Romans 3.11, there is none who seeks for God. And what he means by that, of course, is in their own strength as they come into this world. And they don't, I think you know very well by now, because of their they're, the fact they're indisposed toward God. They do not love God. They do not love what he stands for. They do not love his character. He's holy. He loves what is right and good, and they do not. That's what Jesus meant when he says in John 3.20, for everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. I mean, just think about our Lord Jesus Christ, who is holiness itself. I mean, his, he, had perfectly, he had perfect character, no fault, no blemish. There was nothing wrong with him. And he was in the world, and the world hated him. The darkness hated him. He was talking about himself here when he says that those who do evil hate the light and will not come to the light. They will not come to him because they love the darkness and they hate the light. And let's not forget that that was your condition when you came into the world. You hated the light and you didn't want God and you weren't seeking him either. Now there are people who think that they want God and they want God to save them from hell and so forth, but that's the only reason why people seek him. It's not because they want him. It's not because they love him or desire him. But the fact is, you see, that you didn't seek God because you hated him and wanted nothing to do him. The Lord is the one who sought after you. And that's what Jesus meant when he says in Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The reason why Jesus was sent to Israel was to gather his sheep from among them. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, he said. And by the way, he didn't gather all Israel together, did he? At least national Israel. But he did gather those who were Israel. Paul reminds us they are not all Israel who are of Israel. It's the children of the promise who are the true Israelites. Those are the ones who have faith like Abraham. It's not just the fact that you're a natural child of Abraham that makes you a child of God or a true sheep of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ's sheep hear his voice and they follow him. And what that means is that when the Lord came to his own people, he wasn't actually seeking everyone. He was seeking his elect. He was seeking those that the Father had chosen from before the foundation of the world that they might be holy and blameless. Jesus even says with regard to his disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Well, if the Lord has chosen you, then he will seek you. He will look for you. He will draw you to himself. Jesus tells us that that has to happen before you can come. And again, the reasons are clear. If your heart is not inclined towards him at all, you're not going to go towards him. You never desire, well, you never actually go after something you don't desire. You only go after the things you really want. If you don't want him, you're not going to do that, which means you're not going to seek him. The Lord has to seek you. If you're going to come to him, there's something he has to do. Jesus calls that drawing. It's something that he, the Father does. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. No one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. There is something that Jesus must do. There's something the Father must do. It's called drawing. But it's the Lord seeking after you. Now, as you look at this example of Bartimaeus, it might look like Bartimaeus was actually the one who was doing the seeking. He heard the crowds. 
He knew that Jesus was passing by and he cried out to Jesus. Now it's true that he did that, but we do need to ask the question, why? Why did Bartimaeus do this? Now on the surface, it may look like Bartimaeus simply wanted to regain his sight, and that certainly is true. Many people in those days, when they learn what Jesus was able to do, they sought Jesus in order to heal them. And many went away healed, but also they, when they went away, they went away without being converted. But Bartimaeus appears to be one who was actually converted by Jesus because after Jesus healed him, he began to follow him. Even after Jesus said, go your way, your faith has made you well, Bartimaeus still followed Jesus, which means he had a desire for him. He sought Jesus for more than just his eyes, at least his physical eyes. He sought him for salvation. Now, if it is true that Bartimaeus actually sought the Lord in this way, how did he do it, especially considering what the Bible says is true about him when he came into the world, that he hated the light, that he had a heart that was indisposed toward God. Well, obviously, the Lord must have been seeking him. Remember, Jesus says, no one comes to me unless it has been granted him by the Father. Bartimaeus never would have sought the Lord if the Lord had not first been seeking him. The way you can know that God is seeking you is when you begin to seek the Lord. So again, if you would be saved, the Lord must first seek you inwardly. He must issue that, that inward call. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, drawing you to the Lord Jesus Christ. But secondly, you need to realize that if you would be saved, he must also call you outwardly through the gospel. You might say that this is the way that you come to realize your inward call. You have to respond to the gospel by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't be saved apart from that. Bartimaeus would never have been converted if the Lord had not first sought him and given him the desire to reach out to Jesus. But there was something that Bartimaeus needed to do. Bartimaeus had to respond to that call when Jesus called him when he commanded him to come. So there is this inward call, this work of the Spirit of God changing that heart of stone that hates God into a heart of flesh that desires him. But there is also that evidence that the change has been wrought or have the change has, has been accomplished in your heart, that your heart is no longer one of stone, but now one of flesh. And that is the evidence of how you respond to the gospel when the Lord calls you through the gospel. Again, when Jesus called Bartimaeus, he didn't just sit there. You know, if, if he had sat there and Jesus passed by him, he would have remained blind. Bartimaeus had to respond. He had to listen to that call. He had to respond in faith before his eyes would be opened. Now, one thing we do need to bear in mind is this, that it is true that Jesus would never pass by any of the sheep. Every one that the Father has chosen is going to be called. Every one that he has calls in this way is going to respond to the call, is going to respond to the outward call. Every single one of those sheep is going to be saved but it's also true, on the other hand, that none of his sheep, none of those that the, that the Father has chosen who receive that inward call are going to refuse the outward call. They will hear the Lord's voice as he calls them in the gospel, and they're going to come. Jesus says, remember in John chapter 10, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life. They hear the voice of Jesus Christ as he calls them in the gospel. Now, why am I laboring this point? I mean, I, I think it's something we're fairly familiar with. I think it's because that um, sometimes the Bible's teaching on the doctrine of election can have the effect of paralyzing a person and keeping them actually from coming to the Lord Jesus Christ because you're just really not sure whether the Lord has, in fact, chosen you. 
you don't know whether you are one of the elect. And you think, well, if I'm not one of the elect, it doesn't matter what I do, I'm going to be lost. But if I'm one of the elect, it doesn't matter what I do, I'm going to be saved. Well, that's not true. The fact is that you really can't know your election unless you, first of all, respond to the gospel. And if you're going to be saved, you have to respond to the gospel. You have to come to Jesus Christ in faith. So really, we need to move your concern from what happens to be written in God's book, at least as he describes it, the book of life, instead to your response or your reaction to the gospel of whether or not you're actually hearing him and coming to him. That's the only thing you really need to be concerned about is hearing his call to you through the gospel and responding to it in faith. You know, Jesus says that anyone who is concerned about the condition of their souls may come to him. As a matter of fact, he calls them to. He commands them to come. Matthew 11, verses 28 through 29, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You know, it's also true that Jesus says, the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. Jesus will not refuse you if you come to him. Now, you know, there's a great deal of wisdom in what uh, Anthony Burgess wrote um, in the quote that I included on the back of your uh, bulletin this morning. When I first read it, I thought I was kind of shocked by it, and maybe you will be as well, but it is in fact true. It reminded me of one thing we did study in seminary. He says, For no man is damned precisely because God has not chosen him, because he is not elected, but because he is a sinner and willfully refuses the means of grace offered. I think sometimes we think it's otherwise. A person is damned because he's not chosen, but that is not the reason why God condemns anyone. That's the reason, by the way, why the, the confession says, you know, that he predestines whom he will to life and he who foreordains others to death. Why the difference of terminology? Why predestination? Why foreordination? Why not use the same word for both? Well, it's because they're trying to make a distinction here. The only reason why anyone will go to heaven is because God has chosen them. But the reason why people are condemned is because of their sin. It's not because God didn't choose them. It's because of their sin. It's because they refuse to come to the Lord Jesus Christ in order that they might be saved. The reason why anyone is lost is not because of God's choice. God doesn't condemn anyone on the basis of his choice of whether or not they're elect. He condemns only those who refuse to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who will not trust in his son. So again, that makes the, the, the crux of the concern a lot clearer, a lot, more, uh, lot, lot simpler. Do you want to be saved? Then you need to repent. You need to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Receive him as your savior and rest upon him. Trust his righteousness, his works alone to save you and to bring you to heaven. That's all you need to do. All you need to do is come to him and he will receive you. You don't need to worry about your election. Stop worrying about your election and stop making excuses not to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but believe on him and you will be saved. That's true. Anyone who comes to Jesus Christ and trusts in him will be saved. Anyone who is willing, who's tired of their sins and wants to be saved from those, all you have to do is come to Jesus Christ and you will be saved. If that's your desire, that means that the Lord is working that inward call in your heart. And if you do, in fact, come to Jesus, you will actually show that you are one of his chosen in the same way that Bartimaeus, when he desired to come to Jesus, that desire was put there by the Lord. When Jesus called him, he came and he was healed and he was saved. All because of God's mercy. But Bartimaeus would have never known it unless he had responded to it. 
you have to respond to the gospel. There is that inward call and there is that outward call. By the way, we can also apply this in one other way, and that's the way we've actually been looking at it throughout the service. And that is that no one is going to be saved apart from that outward call. You know, the inward call is necessary. God does have to call inwardly. Otherwise, no one's going to have a desire to come to him. But that, that desire will never be realized apart from the outward call. You know, I suspect there were a number of people in Israel who had already received the inward call and were seeking God before Jesus ever came and began preaching the gospel. But when he came and he preached, they immediately received him, and then they were saved by that gospel when they trusted the Lord. Now, certainly, we can look at that and say there's no way they could have been lost, but the fact is God had issued the inward call, but the outward call had to be issued as well. They have to hear the gospel. If they don't hear, have to hear the gospel, God can save people anywhere in the world, and we don't even have to go out and reach them with the gospel. But the fact is, he won't save them apart from that call. And as I pointed out earlier, it's our responsibility to get that call out to them. Now, I don't think that we're not giving them that call because we don't believe that to be true. I think we believe that to be true. I think we know the gospel has to get out. I think one of the reasons why we're not doing it is because there's a lot of other people and a lot of other churches and other places in the world that can, that can do it. And we don't think that the Lord really needs us to do it. But the fact is, he, he does need all of his people to do that. And the fact is that the people we know, if they don't hear the gospel from any, anyone else, they are actually going to perish. We need to tell them the gospel, and I do think it's worth the risk of uh, you know, risking their friendship and risking their love to tell them. Better that... I hate to put it this way, but better they go to hell hating you than loving you because you weren't willing to tell them the truth. There is nothing that should be higher on our priority list than getting the gospel out to others because they need to hear the gospel before they're going to be saved. So let's apply it secondly in this way. If you want others to be saved... You need to stop worrying about what they think about you. You need to stop wondering whether they're elect or not because you can't know that. You never will know that unless they actually trust in the Lord. You just simply need to share the gospel. That doesn't mean get up on a stage or on a soapbox and preach down at them. It just simply means communicate the gospel in a clear way. Just tell them, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Tell them why they need to be saved. Tell them who Jesus is. Tell them what faith is. It's not that difficult to explain, but they need to hear it. And if they are the Lord's, they will receive it. And they will be saved, just like Bartimaeus did so many years ago, just like you did when the Lord called you. May the Lord grant that we would be encouraged to do that. The gospel is the power of God to salvation. God will save through it. He will call his sheep. And he has not only commanded us to be a part of it, but we can have the privilege of being a part of it. There is no greater privilege in the kingdom of heaven than leading lost souls to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. May God grant to us that we might know that joy. But we won't know it unless we seek to get the gospel out to them. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's, let's ask the Lord to apply what we've heard as we need to hear it, either our need to come to him, to trust him and to be saved, or whether it's simply our need to be encouraged that God actually does save and call through the outward call, through the gospel, and be encouraged then to reach out to those whom we know who need to hear it with it. Let's, let's spend a few moments in prayer.